<clears throat> hey, 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 hey. Hello, welcome to the December 9th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we will go ahead and begin in just a moment. Bear with me just a second. Just excellently shut off my monitoring computer. All right, everything sounds fine on my monitoring computer. Um, all right, so my name is Greg Undo. I'm the host of the live stream. Um, and if you have not attended a live stream before, is um, how it works is you could ask questions in the live chat field, or you could simply send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase you're running, whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, or other Steinberg programs, which which level, like version number. So if you're running 10, 10.5, 11, or 12. And if you're running on Mac or PC, that would be helpful. Um, and so... And when um, asking questions, realize that my ability to answer questions in real time will soon be eclipsed, um, but I'll try my best to keep up throughout the entire live stream. Uh, so if I don't get to your question immediately, we can try to, uh, you know, if we could avoid asking the same question over and over again, that would be great. Um, that would just speed up the whole process so we get more questions answered. Um, as we are doing this, realize, um, you know, that, so, um, and when asking questions, you know, as we do this, um, we'll just make sure that we want, and we should have all of the topics that are covered in the live stream. All the topics today will be, uh, indexed with timestamps and that will be pinned to the top of the comments field. And if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com. And Jan from Stockholm has been gracious enough to create that website for us. Uh, we want to give special thanks to two people that serve as moderators. So we have uh, Agent K and Jazz Dude. They're not Steinberg employees. They just kind of do this out of the kindness of their hearts to make it a better community. And also another wonderful resource of information will give credit to Jazz Dude for his efforts on is the Cubase Nation Discord. And from there, you could find lots of different tutorials and relevant information to the Steinberg community. So once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products. Um, and I'll be the host. I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. area in the United States in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you're watching this live, or even if you're watching it on a replay, feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you are from. Now with that, we will go ahead and begin. All right, so we have a question from Noah uh, Nolbem. Um, Hi, Greg and everyone. Is there a place where I can watch all the presets you have made for a logical editor and a project logical editor? Also, the macros I wrote in Cubase YouTube site, uh, project lo logical editor and logical editor. So, you know, we have um, probably 23,000 different topics that we've done. So if you wanted to search for, you know, like videos on particular uh, macros or logical or project logical editor presets that I've created, um, I would search the Cubase Index site. Um, so go to cubaseindex.com. And you could probably search there and quickly, you know, just look for macros, look for project logical editor or logical editors. And then you could probably navigate quickly to, you know, the 23,000 of the 23,000 plus topics that we've done. All right. Um, so question. Um, 
Also, is it possible to receive all the macro presets that you've made, logical and, and project logical editor commands, an XML file? Uh, so I think they are already uploaded to the Cubase Nation Discord, and uh, Jazz Dude I think got them. Um, so, and I think that he has shared a link in prior live streams. But if you look in, if you look in the Cubase Nation Discord, all of my presets for logical project, logical editor, and macros are uploaded there. All right, so we see Crocante from Los Angeles. Great to see you back. Uh, he has a question. Um, says, uh, hi, Greg. How can I get the master fader to show in the main tracks window to see the level automation line to write a fade out with the pencil? Okay, so anytime we have a project by default, um, and this changed in maybe 9.5 or so, so if you have earlier versions, but you'll see a folder uh, always on your project that says input output channels. So when we open this folder up, we could see our stereo out. And now we could just kind of write in, or if we wanted to do a fade out of our project at the end, we could just click and open that folder. And the very first line that we see will be kind of like our stereo out. And then we could just simply write in new automation just like that. So. So if I start a new project even, we could come here, let's just do create empty. We'll notice that we'll always have this uh, folder, input output channels, then you could just simply open that up and write in automation like so. So just open up the contents of that folder. Yeah, it was kind of involved on a Facebook discussion of someone that that was annoying them that it was always there and they wanted to always have it hidden when opened up. So, and if you wanted to do that, you could just go to the visibility and hide it. But by default, look for the input output uh, channels in a folder and then open up that folder and then that will be present. In previous versions, what you would have to do is to actually go to the master output, write automation, and then it would appear on a project window. So again, just look in the input output channels right there and then you'll see that and then you could just write the automation in. So that was kind of added to simplify the workflow workflow for that particular situation. All right, so we have Benny from Sweden. Thanks for being on. We have David Griffiths checking in from Wales. And he says he had another, another lovely week with Cubase. He's written so many songs. That's wonderful. All right, we have Ari from Israel. Great that you could join us. All right, we have Patrick on. All right, so we have a question from the Heartbreak Time Machine. Um, is there a way to shape, share presets? Uh, we've saved in plugins slash VSTs, and Mastering Engineer has saved a preset for me. Can they send it to me? Uh, certainly. So when you do this, all you have to do is come over. So let's say if we wanted to load up a preset, um, you know, we could just come over here and just to find presets, we could go to uh, like our, let's say if we wanted to go to a VST effects preset, um, we would go to user presets and go to VST effects presets. So let's say I'm directly here. This is my preset that I've saved, let's say in reverence. And then if you right click, you could choose reveal in finder or reveal in explorer. And then that would just open up that particular, um, uh, and you know that particular folder where we could have our different plugin presets right there. So all you have to do is just kind of drop them into that folder. So as soon as we come again, we'll just say go to our media bay in the right hand zone. We go to user presets, VST effects presets, and then to find you could just say, okay, reveal and finder. So if you don't have one, just save an effect plugin preset, and then you could right click and that will take you directly to the location uh, where your presets will be. And you could just drag and drop that preset right into that particular folder and then it will load up for you. All right, so we have Uno Memento checking in from his snowy Finland. He says Santa 
Claus is already to tune up this sled for the sleigh for the Christmas trip. So, all right. So we have a question from Patrick. Uh, can you show how to make a mixing template? Okay, I'm just gonna pop out my chat so I can see it a little better. Wait just a moment. Okay, so what a lot of people um, would want to do when creating kind of a mixing template is they may just, you know, so sometimes I know people will take like one song, maybe like the first song on an album. Um, and then, you know, if they wanted to use that as a, you know, like let's say they wanted everything to be consistent. Um, so what a lot of people would do if, you know, let's say we liked this particular mixing template, uh, that we have for just activate this project here. So, so, you know, I want this as my base point. I'm going to keep the same effects channels, the same plugins, and I want to kind of use that. What I would do is select all of the media and just delete it. I would go to the pool window and choose remove unused media. Um, and then at this point, I would just choose, come over here and we'll say uh, save as template. So at this point, we could call it Patrick. Um, and once we hit OK, now why I got rid of the media and removed it from the project is that I don't want to, every time I start with a template, to have other audio files present in it. So now I'll save this as my mixing template. And at this point, we will say, OK, I'm going to do a new project. And we will see templates under more. And then we could just start off with my Patrick template, I'll say, okay, I want it to be into this particular folder and we'll activate. And then we're ready to go. So, but a lot of people may have a template that's set up. Okay, I use, I know I'm gonna have parallel groups. I want, you know, a parallel group on drums and vocals and guitars. I want this compressor on base, and you could have all of those settings stored, save it as a template, and then just kind of start off your project from that template, and that could really speed up your workflow. All right, wonderful to see Jan from Cubase Index on from Stockholm. All right, we have uh, Jason Sykes from South Shields, England. We have Steve Patrick. Tom W. checking in from a rainy Tennessee. All right, we have Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so Patrick uh, asks, uh, Greg, do you believe in matrix? Like we all live in matrix. We are controlled by someone or something. I haven't really given it much thought, but I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a fan of reality. So, I, you know, if, it, if I am living in a matrix, I haven't really thought of it. If I am living in a matrix, I still have to kind of do my job and, you know, help my son out and, you know, be a good husband to my wife and help people realize their creativity in Cubase. So if that's in a matrix, then I'm there. All right. So we have Antoine checking in from the Netherlands. Thanks for joining us. All right, and so Nick is checking in from a Sub-Zero Essex in the UK, and he says he heard the like button is cold. It warms up if you hit it. And so, yeah, if you do learn a new tip or trick, make sure that you actually do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All right, and we have Val Lee checking in from uh, Vienna, Austria. Thanks for being here today. All right, and we have Vagalurian. All right, and we have... Uh, Michael Jensen, checking in from Jensen Studio in Denmark. Uh, he's using a Mac Studio and Cubase Pro 12. Thanks for being on. All 
All right. Um, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to remove audio connection presets without first selecting them? Okay. So you could probably go into maybe the preferences folder. So let's say if I come here and I'll save a preset. All right, and let's say I just get to um, so doesn't it look like we could you know it looks like it has to be the active preset um, for that to be to be deleted. So once that is the active preset, then you could remove it. Um, so if you wanted to perhaps go into your finder, sorry, and let's take a look and see if we can, if it's in the preferences. So if we come here, um, so on the Mac, I'm going to go to library. And then we'll go to preferences and we'll see if it's in the presets here. Okay, so here's the presets. Um, Maybe like part of a RAM presets, maybe kind of. Yeah, so I think the quickest way is going to be to, you know, just to load it and then be able to delete it as as needed, which, which I think can make sense. But sorry about that. All right, so Steve Patrick uh, just asked, uh, please, Greg, I'm in Cubase Artist, uh, but I'm new to DAW. I can't find Very Audio editing. All right, so Very Audio is part of the sample editor. So let's say if I wanted to do some Very Audio editing. I'll show you how to do this. And this came in Cubase Artist 11 and 12, I think, is when it was introduced into the artist version. All right, so let's say I have a vocal file, so I'm going to double click on the vocal file, and that could take me into uh, my sample editor. So now I'm let's say if I take my sample editor to full screen just by hitting the little arrow here on the left hand side, we'll see different tabs. We want to select the very audio tab. We'll go to the very audio, and then we could just edit, and then you'll see kind of the very audio editing. So if you don't have that tab selected and this button illuminated, it won't be activated. So again, double click on like a monophonic source. And if you wanted to see it in the lower zone, you can come over here to very audio, make sure that's the active tab. And you could just do your very audio editing directly here. So let me know if that's helpful. And congratulations on being a new Cubase user, Patrick. Glad to have you here on the live stream. All right. So we see Filter Freak is uh, count count hacked. Sorry to hear that, but we're glad you can make it as now as OEW. So. All right. Um, all right. So we have a question from Patrick. Uh, Greg, I played chords on piano while we dropped chords into chord track. Uh, it finds some chords, but it's not recognizing correctly. 
Can you show that play own chords, including bass note, and drop it into chord track? All right, so let's say if I have a chord track here. Um, so I'll just double click here and I'm gonna activate the MIDI input and I'll just randomly play chords. So let's say I'll just we'll go to next. And then at that point, the chords will just kind of show up directly inside of, you know, as we go to the chord definition. So if we go to add a new chord track, so if I hit a D and then let's say, um, and I'll play a D under an E minor chord. So if we come here, so. Um, so that's how you could do the chord recognition. So sometimes you're always said there can be, you know, many different interpretations of chords or what are played. And sometimes I know people will just play two, two notes. So let's say you play like a C and a G and a C and a G. That, you know, sometimes that may not, um, I don't. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, you know, make sure that you have three different pitches selected as opposed to, you know, uh, three notes where two of the notes are doubled. But it seems usually works pretty well with that. All right. Wonderful to see Gareth on from Spain. Glad you could be on early. All right. And we have Ubukun checking in from Nigeria. Thanks for being here. All right, and we have Mr. Dali67 checking in from um, Denmark. All right, um, we have a question. Just my chat field jumped on me. Uh, from Mr. K I think it's Mr. Kali. Uh, how do you record from one audio track to another in real time? Okay, so let's say I have this track. Um, so what we need to do is to route it to an output or to a group. So I'm gonna add a group channel to the selected. So we'll just call this vocal, pat, vocal bus. And we'll hit okay. And now what I want to do is to add an audio track. And for its input, I want it to be vocal bus and I'll just say let's make it a mono track so now when I play so I could now just come over here and record so I want to make sure that this is um, that this track here is coming from the vocal bus input, let me just, I'm gonna add in our audio track. And now we could just record. And we can make it a mono group if we wanted to keep it all mono. So again, to kind of do this, just uh, route this to a, um, we'll route it to a group channel. So let's say I'll just make this a mono group channel this time. All right. We'll say vocal record. Let's add a mono audio track and set our vocal record as the input. We'll add the track. And then just hit record.
and uh, you could capture different effects and different processing if you wanted to. So let me know if that works for you. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, instrument track versus rack. What are the main differences, if there are any at all? Uh, any CPU slash RAM differences? Um, so generally, um, you know, there used to be more distinctions between them. Um, so the original intention was an a instrument rack would have a MIDI uh, a MIDI track that was sent to the instrument rack, much like we would have a rack of you know synthesizers or tone modules. Uh, and this is you know going back to the mid '90s when that was the common paradigm. So we take a MIDI track, we route it to a rack of hardware. So instead of a rack of hardware, that turned into a rack of uh, MIDI of you know a rack of instruments so when we come over here to our vst eyes we can say okay i'm going to have a number of instruments here um what an instrument track was designed to do is to but when we have a midi track so when we have a midi track you know this midi could be going out to a particular uh hardware device or it could be going into a software device so with that, a MIDI track doesn't retain and doesn't necessarily know the complete audio path. So to simplify things so that we could load up an instrument and have a track that went directly to the instrument that wasn't a MIDI track and where Cubase knew the exact audio outputs, that's when instrument tracks were created to simplify the process. Um, so when people were doing this to simplify the process, initially instrument tracks were set up to be stereo outputs only, and it was they weren't multi-timbral. Um, so now, you know, as t as times have changed, and a lot of people are working with this have never worked with a rack of external MIDI devices. Um, We've added the capability within instrument tracks over the years to have multiple outputs and to also have them work multi timbrally. So, um, some devices, like if you're running, like uh, I think a lot of people that run VE Pro will use MIDI tracks to go out to that to, to their VE Pro server so that they could play instruments on a different computer and have that integrated and that works better than instrument tracks. So there's fewer distinctions. Um, one other minor difference is with MIDI tracks, we could have um, MIDI sends as well as uh, as well as, um, so if I add a MIDI track, we could have MIDI inserts and MIDI sends where a MIDI plugin could be sent to a different destination, but instrument tracks don't have MIDI sends, only MIDI inserts. So, so a lot of the, dis the obvious distinctions have kind of morphed and have kind of dissolved. Uh, I think most people are working now in instrument tracks just for workflow sake. All right, so we have Graham Gardner checking in from Yorkshire, UK. Thanks for joining us. Uh, David Barbush checking in from Tampa Bay, and he's like number 23, so thanks for joining us. Used to spend a lot of time in Tampa when I was a traveling sales rep. All right, so we have uh, Jeweler the Rocket checking in from Ontario. Thanks for being on. Um, so we see from Patrick, uh, Greg, have you ever met or spoke to Thomas Bergerson? Uh, how he's making this kind of music with Cubase, I wonder. So I, I'm not familiar with his works. So I don't. I'm not sure if I've spoken to him. Um, but if you have a contact, I'd, you know, and if he needs help, I'd be happy to help him out. So. All right. Uh, so we have a question. Um, do different audio interfaces compromise or affect Cubase VSTs or plugins sound quality in general? 
So the most part, you know, for working with VST instruments, it's going to affect, you know, the over, the overall quality of the sound. Um, you know, the audio interface is just kind of playing that back, you know. So where differences can really be apparent is when you're recording audio in, you know, and you, you know, like the quality of the converter, the quality of the mic preamplifier, uh, any like onboard DSP, you know, that can make a difference. I think if you're just using it to play back different instruments, that the quality of, you know, when you export the file, the quality may not be affected by your audio interface, but what you're monitoring to it and how you're uh, making decisions based on what you're hearing does. But if you take a sine wave, uh, you know, and ran it through the same processing and exported it the same way with different audio interfaces, I think that it would be the same if if the audio wasn't actually recorded through the interface, but it was just kind of playing back. Some audio interfaces, you know, can sound different, uh, and they could have different clocking techniques, you know, different components of the analog, you know, and the, you know, the hardware layout can make a significant difference. You know, like if you talk to Rupert Neve, you know, like uh, placement of components was a critical part of, you know, how he designed equipment. So stuff like that can make a difference. But if you're not recording, I think it's going to be pretty much the same uh, regarding which audio interface, but realize that some audio interfaces can run higher loads at lower latencies. So that could be a factor as well. All right, so we have Soren from Sweden. All right, and unfortunately it looks like Soren is struck down with COVID. So we hope it's a mild case for you and that you recover quickly. So Gareth liked my matrix comment. All right. All right. So we have uh, King Drew uh, underscore five sixty two says tuning in from Los Angeles. Uh, it says, I'm fine. I'm missing a lot of features. I have Cubase LE AI 9.5, need to upgrade, uh, have a key license inserted for access. Um, so yeah, there's obviously tons of new, uh, new features are available. And one of the great things is once you're in, you know, if you have Cubase LE or AI, you know, you could upgrade with a particular discount as well. So, uh, take advantage of once you're kind of in with your, OEM version to LE or AI versions of Cubase that come bundled with hardware that you have kind of a path uh, at a discounted rate to upgrade to, you know, Cubase Elements, Artist or Pro at a discount. All right, so we have Lamarck Kirkwood just saying what's up. So thanks for joining us. All right, and we have Lang Jiang checking in from Minneapolis. Spike Williams just says, yes, your reality is extremely helpful to us all. So, All right, and we have the Heartbreak Time Machine has smashed the like button. Thank you for that. All right, uh, so we have a question from G.O. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, via the chord track, how do I set myself up to experiment and transform MIDI ARP notes? Okay, so I'll just do, let's say, a new project. Or I'll just, uh, we could actually just go to another project to show this. Okay, so let's say I have a bass part here. And 
And I want to open up a MIDI insert on this particular track, so say in our, our patchy. So now when I play a chord. All right, so now if I wanted this to uh, work with the chord track, so I'm just gonna drop some chords in and experiment. So let's say, All right, and all right, so let's say we have this as our chord progression. All right, so what I'm gonna do is to actually tell this um, synth bass, so I'm gonna have this monitor. So now when we play, let's see if I did this right. So now the synth bass is following the chord tracks. So I just put, I said use monitor tracks. So I just had the synth bass monitor. So nothing's actually playing. So I was like, okay, let's come over here and let's switch this to two octaves. And now, and let's say I want to adjust the length. I want step size to be. So it's an easy way to experiment. So, you know, the chord track is looking to play back through the synth bass. And then at that point that we could just hook up in different arpeggiators. And at that point we could just say, okay, I want this to and we could just have it automatically generate different bass lines without even playing a single note using the chord track with that. So let me know if that's what you want it to uh, accomplish there. All right, so we have a feature request. Uh, any progress on changing the autosave.bac files to designated folder in the project? Uh, I guess the project folder really gets messy having .bac and .csh in top level alongside .cpr files. Thanks. Um, yeah, so it's always kind of, I, I keep asking for this feature. Uh, I'm not sure why, you know, it doesn't seem, I'm not a software developer, I'm not smart enough, but it doesn't seem like the hardest thing to do. Um, but I'll make sure to reiterate the request again. All right, so we see from Patrick, um, says, Greg, on a previous live stream, I asked about CC1 modulation. I found out that was in step, so I couldn't do, when I watched your old uh, video, change it to ramp, and it worked. So uh, glad that was an easy solution for that. All right, now we have um, Rob checking in from Tarpon Springs, Florida says he's very busy with his Cubase and Wave projects and appreciates the help. So we're glad that you could join us today. All right, um, so we see probably a further uh, question on the MIDI to the chord track. Uh, says, yeah, Greg, yes, I did this, but I played on MIDI, on Flow. Now I can drag and drop into chord track. Does it work? Can you show us how that's done? All right, so let's say if I was just here and I'll just play some nonsensical chords on this voice here. So let's say as we play, 
So I'll just put this into record and. All right, so say um, now that I've done that, so I just played and we can see that it will just automatically take the chords that I played right here and put them directly into the chord track. So, so again, if I just come here, let's say, okay, I'll play an F major chord. So, um, so with that, it seems like that was kind of matching what I played there, kind of just automatically created. So let me know if I did something different than you, Patrick. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, can I freeze 10 tracks at a time? Is there a way? So if we have multiple events here, so let's say, Uh, this event and this event and going to here. So I think, and this came in 1201, I think, or 1101. So if we go to, um, maybe under edit. So we can say uh, free selected tracks with current settings. So now those tracks are frozen. And so again, just uh, whatever you have, whatever tracks are selected, we can come right over here. And if you want to then unfreeze. You can just come over here and unfreeze. So again, to do that, select the tracks that you want, uh, go to edit, and freeze, unfreeze, selected tracks, just like that. All right, um, so we see, uh, question. Uh, hi, Greg. Is it possible to rename CCs in the MIDI editor instead of general purpose for hardware synth? I could name it something different like LFO, etc. So they're, they're kind of um, with the particular MIDI specification. Um, you know, so th there's not a way to rename it that I know of. Um, but I think as, as long as it's, you know, when you look at it, because it's not necessarily an LFO message, it's a, um, you know, it might be general purpose controller one message, or it might be controller 65. So if you switch different, if you copy that to, to a different instrument, then it's not going to play back LFO. So I think that's kind of the reasoning behind it. So. chat field jumped on me sorry about that okay um all right so we have a question from patrick uh what's the main reason we have quantized note length in cubase uh, if i do it to everything does it affect human touch you know so if i was here let's say i wanted all of these notes you know to only be half notes so at this point so you know anytime you do quantizing it could affect you know, what people perceive as a human touch. But, you know, if I wanted to go to here to, you know, my advanced quantize, we could say, okay, I wanted to set this to, you know, half notes. 
And now, you know, if we wanted to quantize uh, the event ends, you know, we could just simply, you know, clean up performances that way. And this could be helpful not only just kind of for the starts or, uh, <clears throat> you know, many people think of quantizing is just for the start of events. But, you know, if we wanted to, you know, also quantize the event lengths. So we could just say, okay, I want to quantize the lengths of these notes to half notes as well. Or we could position, you know, so if we wanted each of the notes to be half notes, we could do that. Or if we want it just their ending to snap to, uh, you know, to the end, like maybe you're doing like a, something like a, and like an impact kind of thing that you want those particular MIDI notes to end at the downbeat. Uh, and it's not really critical, you know, it may not be as critical where they start, but where it ends for kind of like, you know, like when there's a little action build up type of things. And that's why you have, kind of the distinctions between, you know, quantizing the end of the notes, the length, or just, you know, typical quantization for the start of the note. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, do you know the best, uh, your best way to avoid having to route Colorize name tracks and channels when starting a new mixing project, perhaps a template combined with the logical editor. You know, so a lot of times templates can, can have all of your colors automatically preserved for you. So if I went back, if I was mixing like, you know, a rock band kind of stuff, I could say, okay, I want my drums to always be blue. You know, I want my bass this color. You know, I remember <clears throat> if you watch, uh, there's a Steinberg Spotlights video with infected mushrooms, and they're very, you know, very adamant that, you know, kick is always this color. Bass is always this color. So, you know, and that's how they've worked for years. And someone else may have the complete opposite, you know, colors, but it's whatever is kind of set up for you. But you could also just come over here and say, you know, you could create a logical editor, a project logical editor preset. Um, and then if you wanted to <clears throat> chain multiple project logical editor presets together in a macro, you could do that. So let's say I want it to, let me just save this. Okay, so I will just remove everything. So let's say like every time I know that I want to be my electric bass you know, or a track name bass, I want it to be green or we'll just pick a color here. So if you want it to automatically colorize things quickly, you could say, okay, I want to, we're gonna choose transform and we're gonna say uh, name, contains base. I'll just type even BAS. Um, and then we could say, okay, for tracks name base, we want to set color to a fixed value. And I want my base to always be this color. Or I'll just choose something different than drums. So let's say green, uh, let's make it purplish. So now if any track that has a name base, I could just come over here and that will automatically color stuff. So if you start off with your template colored, you don't have to worry about that. But if you get someone else's project, you could create multiple conditions like, you know, anything that has, um, you know, and we could say, you know, name contains KI for kick, um, name, or name contains SN, so for snare. So we can say, now I want those to be yellow. So we'll say, okay, if it has KI or SN, you know, um, so we'll just say set to fix new color. So, and we'll choose this to be or, so now, 
We could just come over and say, okay, I want all these that have KI for kick or SN for snare or TO for Tom, whatever kind of naming condition that you want, we can just kind of set directly there. So, so if you set up a couple of those things and you're good with your names, then you could just put multiple of the multiple of those project logical editor conditions to have everything kind of automatically named for you and your project. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, so no real difference in CPU RAM when it came to instrument tracks versus racks. So generally not, you know, uh, if it's going to be kind of the same project, um, you know, so sometimes people would use uh, instrument racks or instrument tracks because they weren't multi-timbral. Um, and a lot it's in, in previous generations, a lot of the instruments, once you ran like 16, in, 16 different sounds in one instrument, that instrument would take only one CPU core. So some people would say, oh, you know, if we do it like that, then, uh, it, uh, you know, running 16 instrument tracks versus 16 MIDI tracks going to an instrument track or to, to, to an instrument rack. So, if, you know, a lot of instruments when run multi timberally don't utilize multi cores. Halion Sonic, Halion, Halion Sonic SE do. So you're able to kind of utilize multiple cores for that, but a lot of instruments didn't. So in that case, if your instrument didn't support uh, multi core processing and you're running it as an instrument rack, then that could take that could be less CPU efficient on a multi core system than having 16 different instrument tracks. So I know it's a little confusing. But if it, if it was the same settings between an instrument rack and an instrument track, they would be identical. So. All right. Um, so we see All right, so we see uh, Jazz Dude mentioned about iterative quantize option. Um, so we'll show that just in case you want to see it. So, um, and this is with Patrick's question. So let's say I have um, a bunch of notes here and I'll just put it in quickly into a quick drum editor here. All right, so let's say I had shifted all of these notes a little to the left. Now, one of the other quanti quantization functions that you have is called iterative quantization. So let's say my play head is right now exactly, let's say it's, it's on the beat, but this is where the note is. So let's say I wanna take this particular note and I want to move that note, but I want it to, um, you know, basically have a more human feel. So I'm going to select this to be, let's say, a 16th note for my quantization. And then we could have what we call our IQ mode or iterative quantize mode. So if we don't have IQ on and I quantize, that note goes directly to the 16th note. So now with IQ mode on, we could have a percentage. So we're gonna say, I hit quantize, that note moves 80% closer to the quantized value. So if I hit it again, it moves another 80% between that distance, but it's still not perfectly on the beat as we zoom in. If I hit quantize again, it moves 80% closer, 80% closer. So this way, people will often call this kind of a soft quantize, but this is a percentage-based quantization. So if you wanted stuff to be human, but still sound a little tighter, but not so rhythmically dead-on accurate, iterative quantization is a good way of doing that. So think of it as a percentage-based quantization, so that it, you know, 100% is moving it to the note, um, but 
If we do 80%, it's always splitting the difference to the beat by 80% every time you do it. All right. All right, so we have uh, Vishnu from India. Uh, and he asked his question. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, if, I'm, if I've installed the Cubase sound library in my Mac, Mac HD drive, can I move this to another drive? So yeah. And there's a utility called the Steinberg Library Manager. And all you have to do is say, okay, we have all these different files here. You can just click on move and then prompt where you want the files to be moved to. And that will make sure that the program knows where to look for the files so that you don't get all sorts of weird missing files messages. And this is installed as a part of the Cubase installation. So you wanna to go to the Steinberg Library Manager uh, and then select the different libraries here and you could just say move and then you could just simply move it to another hard disk. Same for your different content for Groove Agent samples, Howling and Sonic samples, Pad Shop content. All right, so we have a question. Um, can you show how to quickly create separate tracks to use one instance of example Howling and using it in multi timbral mode? All right, so let's start a new project. All right, so if I start with an instrument track, so I'll load up, I'll add an instrument track and we'll have it set to Howling and Sonic SE. So we play this. All right, so we have one sound loaded on to uh, the, first, uh, the first MIDI channel, we have this track. So let's say if I wanted to do this multi-timbrally, what we could do now is I'm gonna add MIDI tracks. And, and since we have the instrument track selected, it's gonna be smart enough to automatically keep the same instrument assignment for the output port. And let's say I add seven MIDI tracks. These will now, when we look at the MIDI channels, we'll see that this is MIDI channel one, MIDI channel two. And I go to the next track. I three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now if I want it to come over here and we'll load up a different sound for MIDI channel. So let's say, okay, I want um, kalimba sound here. And let's say for channel three, I want it to just come over here, let's load up something from Flux. So now when I want to go to channel four, we could load up completely different Now what's kind of cool about this is when I select a different track, this is the channel that's automatically selected in Howling and Sonic SE. So this way I could select a track and the and especially if we have like different editors available. Now that I select the track, we can see all the different editors automatically update without having to do anything in particular. So now we have four instruments and we can have up to 16 in Howling and Sonic SE. If you have the full version of Howling and you could have up to 64. So you have four banks of 16 MIDI channels. So that's how you can work multi temporally with Howling and Sonic SE. All right, uh, so we have a question from Benny. Uh, is there going to be one more Zoom live meeting this year? So yeah, I think the last, um, I will be taking some time off over Christmas. It'll be on the 20th. Uh, we'll do, that'll be the last live stream for the calendar year. 
Um, and then we will do a, a Zoom party. Maybe we'll do a holiday thing. Um, I'll see if we can maybe get some giveaways, um, kind of like when we had our 250th. We'll see if we could get – I'll reach out to my colleagues at Steinberg and see if we can uh, maybe get some prizes for the – uh, for the Zoom meeting on the 20th. So again, that will be Tuesday the 20th, and that will be the last live stream, and then we'll pick up on kind of normal schedule uh, following in January. I'll just look at my calendar real quick. Um, but I think if we just go to, yeah, so we'll pick up again on um, January 3rd. So, And then we'll be back on our regular Tuesday and Friday schedule, and we'll kind of get right back into it after the holidays. So yeah, look for uh, the Zoom meeting a uh, week from this upcoming Tuesday on the uh, 20th of December. All right, uh, so we have Bob Demers just uh, saying hello from Saratoga, New York. Thanks for joining us, Bob. All right, um, so we see Patrick just saying, uh, Greg, do you use Discord? So I've been on the Cubase Nation Discord a bunch of times. I, I don't necessarily, um, you know, search out other Discord channels, So, but I've been on the Discord before. Um, so, but a lot of times I, you know, have lots of other work responsibilities in addition to the live streams as well, so it keeps me busy and then... Outside of work, I, you know, will make sure my son is having fun and doing well and spend time with him and my wife. All right, so we see Spike Williams just saying, uh, as for audio interfaces, I was happy with my old setup and M audio, but my URRT has taken my recording quality to a whole new level, amazing clarity. So, yeah, so like as you're recording in, especially with the RT interfaces with the Rupert Neves transformer is that's a wonderful solution. It's well above its price point. All right. Great to see Madge Deepers from, she's saying a very cold UK. So glad you could join us. We'll warm you up with some knowledge. Thanks for being here. All right, uh, so you see uh, I'm using two screens. On each screen, I can jump from window to window by using the tab key. Is there a shortcut key for jumping from screen to screen like the windows? Um, so I think, um, and I don't have my two screens hooked up right now, but you know, generally how I have mine running is you know, I have my project window and my mixer on two different ones. So when I hit F3, you know, that takes me to the, that makes the, uh, the window with, you know, the screen with the mix console active. Um, so, and that way I could just simply kind of, you know, go back and forth between the two windows. But I think since Windows sees it as one particular screen, that it's just treating it as different windows. So I don't think that there's, and there may be a graphics card that allows you to, you know, have a screen to go, you know, a key command to go directly to, uh, you know, a particular screen. But generally most people will stretch the Cubase screen, you know, stretch the same screen across multiple screens, multiple monitors. Uh, but it's the same background and then, you know, kind of resize the windows to fit. And if that's the case, like if the overall background area is kind of seeing it as one screen, it sees it as kind of one one screen that's split across two monitors. All right, so we see Michael Pierce is joining us. He says he got biological molecules out of his head an hour of Cubase then Well, probably more biological molecules. Glad you could join us, Michael. And Gareth likes biological molecules as a name for a band, but you can't say it six times really fast.
You can see Spike Williams is hoping for a hot soup, so maybe Michael Pierce will be able to contribute a soup recipe for tonight. I had soup a couple times this week. I was thinking of Michael Pierce with all his great soup suggestions. All right. All right. Wonderful to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. All right. And we have Manos joining us. He says, nice to join your stream once again. So glad you can make it. All right. Let me just make sure I didn't. Um, I think I may have skipped an area. Let me just make sure. All right, so we have a question from Noah. Um, can you select in one bar in a meter of 4-4 four, four only the third notes from each quarter note that are running in 16ths? For example, I place all C sharp notes in one sixteenth, and then from all the sixteenth notes that are in one bar, I would like to select only the third note and make manipulation of volume or other manipulation. Um, so let's give it a try. We might be able to do it in the project logical editor. So just oops. all right. Hang on just a second. Cubase open here again. All right, so let's take a look and see if we could recreate this. All right, so I'm just going to add an instrument track. All right, so I will just come over here and let's put in some 16th notes. Okay, so let's go blow this up so we can see. All right, I'll just erase some. Doubles I had, all right, so let's say that'll be good. All right, um, so let me re read this again. Um, can you select in a bar in a meter or four four only the third notes from each quarter that are running in 16th for example I placed all C sharp notes in 16th and then from all 16th notes that are in one bar I would like to select only the third note and make manipulation all right okay so let me go ahead and just Okay, so let me just reread this again, see if, make sure I'm understanding it right. Okay, so uh, bar in a meter, 4-4, four, four, only the third notes from each quarter that are running in 1-16th, for example, place all C-sharp notes in 1-16th, and then from all the 16th notes that are in that one bar, I'd like to select only the third note 
and make manipulation of volume or other manipulation. So let's say I want to take only like the third 16th note. Okay, so let's go to your logical editor. Let me just remove this. So we're going to choose to, we'll transform. Okay, so let's say we have this as our velocity. We'll see our velocity indicated. So we want to select notes um, and we'll say last event. Um, equals event counters three. All right, so I'm just going to see, I'm just going to choose select here. So I think that this will select every third note. Or we could choose to every other event. So we'll say event counter, so three. All right, so now we can select every third note here. Um, all right, so let's say if I want to transform every other third note and I want it to now increase the velocity, let's add 20 to a velocity value. Um, so now we're going to do is take every third note in this particular phrase and increase the velocity value to by 20. So if we do this right, we could see that every third note, and if we wanted to take every third note that was, um, that equal to G3, let's say, instead of like C sharp one. Let's come here, insert, um, we'll say value one is equal to G3. So let's say I will just put a bunch of notes as G3 here. So now let's say if I just want to take this So you might be able to kind of play with that, but this way you could take like every um, third note and then, you know, add 20 to the settings. So we just come here. So let's say if I wanted to come and let this insert the G3 again. So I remove that there is insert. We'll say value one is equal to G3. And then we could see that some of the notes will just change their velocity based on that condition. So, um, so let me know if that's kind of what you want to do. All right, uh, so Gareth is saying uh, play chord features, revelation of the day, kind of. <laughs> Nick is saying 32% of a revelation, all right. All right, um, so we have a question from Steve Patrick. Um, can I get keys from, uh, keys chord from various auto tracks or from audio tracks? So yeah, if you want to do that, we can just come over. Go to this project. I'll show you. All 
right? So say I have a guitar part here. So if I have a chord track here, I'm just gonna drag uh, my audio part and then we could just have the chords automatically detect it like that. And so again, if we have a chord track open, let's go to the guitar track and we could drag that up uh, or another way is to go to uh, your project menu and go to chord track and say create chord events and then that will automatically uh, populate the chord track and you can figure out what the key is. Uh, so this is that over in the key of A major and you could do that from audio as well. See Gareth is saying it's a minor third re revelation. We'll call it a Picardy third. We we'll get real technical with our music theory here. So you can look it up if you don't know. All right. Um, so we see uh, from Alex Morgan, is there a way to assign a key command to turn the volume up and down in the control room? So I don't think it's a key command, but you could do it from like a generic remote or you could do it from, you know, a MIDI remote. So let's say if I come here uh, to MIDI remote and, you know, I just want it, let's say if I come here, um, I could say, okay, let's pick up for MIDI remote mapping. And then I could select the knob that I want it to control. So let's say we'll come here to, and then we'll apply the mapping. And now as soon as we I move the knob here, that knob will automatically control the volume. So it's not necessarily a key command, but you can drive it from any MIDI message that you want uh, through the MIDI remote, which I think probably makes more sense overall. Gareth agrees that purple is the best color for bass. That's good. All right. Um, all right. So we have a question from Johnny D. Glad you can make it. Um, What's the difference between versions and lanes for comping takes and when and how to use each of them? Thanks. Okay, so let me see if I still... Um, let's see if I have this project open. I think I... All right, so... All right, so I, you know, I tend to think, all right, so when we have track versions and lanes, um, it's kind of two different paradigms. So we could think of, you know, a lane as being kind of a multiple, like a long recording. So let's say I was playing this. All right. Now let's say I had this in cycle record mode and while I'm kind of recording at the same points, I could come over here and say, okay, we have now take two. It's one contiguous recording, but as it's cycled back, this would be the second pass, but in actuality, this file could be much longer. So if we did a cycled recording, So in essence, this could be one long recording that would stretch out to here, but since it was in cycle, it's gonna be placed into different lanes. Now when comping, I prefer lanes for single parts, like vocals, guitar solos, and I prefer track versions. If you're not familiar with what track versions are, 
is, you know, if we don't want to see the lanes, what a track version is going to allow us to do is to say, okay, I want to keep all of the same settings, um, but now I just wanted to come here and uh, we'll duplicate the version. And let's say I wanted to do like a really bad edit here. So let's say um, I'm doing a horrible track version edit and I come here and we now have moved all this stuff. And let's say, okay, I want to go to version one or I wanted to now go to my version with all the edits. So I don't have to worry about, you know, switching any of my parts, um, you know, switching, copying over the mixer, stuff like that. So when I'm recording a band and they're doing multiple takes, I would do each take as a track version because if it was for an entire band, I could say, okay, I want to go to take two for the whole band, um, and then we could select all the tracks in in the group and then just switch between takes one and take two, take three, take four. So you may say, okay, take one was great on the drums, but take two was really good on bass or version two, and version four is the one for guitars. And since they all play together really well, you know, with a click track, we can take different performances from different musicians. So uh, for really kind of fine tuning a single part for vocals and guitar solos, I use, tra I use the lanes. And when kind of working with multiple takes um, for an ensemble, I would use track versions. All right. Um, all right. So we see uh, qu uh, just comment and uh, the response about experimenting with chord pads is sufficient. Can we explore the different ways to tune uh, drum and melodic samples to different keys and perhaps the key of the project? Um, so, you know, if you have, you know, depending on your samples, you know, if your samples are set to a particular key, you know, and you're doing something like in the sample, sampler track, you could have that automatically, uh, you know, with, you know, within the MIDI editors themselves. So let's say if we come here, we go into the MIDI editor, you know, we do have the scale assistant. So you could just come over here and quantize pitches, you know, based on the particular scale. So let's say, okay, um, I want this to be um, so my my scale here. I want it to be E minor. So now I could quantize the pitches and say, okay, I want this to be C major. Then we could, you know, just come over and say, okay, I want to quantize all the pitches to a particular scale. Now, if I was starting with loops and stuff like that, we could do that quite easily. So let's say, okay, I was building a particular project. So let's say I will come over to drum loops. So let's say, okay. All right, so let's say, okay, I want to drag this at the beginning of the project. Okay, so now let's say we have harmonic content in the particular project. So I'm going to put this into musical mode, so that's going to automatically synchronize to the tempo. So let's say, okay, I'm going to slow this down to 100. Now we could have something called the project root key. So, so I'm going to enable the project root key here. And I want this to be in the key of, uh, let's say, D. So now when I go to melodic content, I'll say, okay, um, I want this to be a bass part. 
and I drag this in. That's going to automatically match to the key of D. So let's say, okay, I want it to come over here to assembly so now I wanted to find a Rhodes and let's say this Rhodes is in G sharp now when I drag it in it's automatically going to follow that particular key so say like, okay I want to grab like a funk guitar that's an E minor I drop it in So now, let's say I'll just take this, we'll put that into musical mode. So let's say I want to change this all down to the key of E. to A. So once you have the project root key set, any of the content that you have can automatically follow the particular key for you. So. All right, uh, so we have uh, Jeweler to Rocket. Uh, hi Greg, how can I set a macro for LoopMash FX plug in to control it via, via my MIDI in Cubase. All right, so let's say I want to take my horrible composition here. Um, I'll just solo the drums. And let's say I have uh, on my drums a loop mash FX. Okay, so we'll go to other. And loop mash is amazing for coming over here and being able to. Now if I want to. So if you wanted to chop or all right now how if we wanted to control this with MIDI we don't need to make a macro all we have to do is come over here we add a MIDI track and then let's set its output to loop mash FX and then as I can now just play my MIDI keyboard and my MIDI keyboard will actually just simply control these particular parameters. So I'll just hit uh, Alter Option plus K. And now I could just show you that. So just make a MIDI track and set the output port of that MIDI track to Loop Mash FX and then it's going to automatically allow you to interact with that from a MIDI keyboard. All right, so we have a question from Patrick. Um, it says, yes, Greg, I hit chords without hitting record. Uh, I played suddenly, then I used retrospective to get that uh, take. Um, says I dropped to the chord track, but the chord shown does it work only if I hit record. So let's say if I'm here, I'll just add. Um, just add an instrument track. Okay, so let's say while I'm doing this,
All right, so now I just kind of laid that out. I'm gonna open up retrospective record. Uh, let's add a chord track. So that was my retrospective record. So we add a chord track. and drag that to the chord track. And so it doesn't have to be, you could do it from retrospective record as well. All right, uh, so we see from Jazzy Lamel. Uh, Hi Greg, can you go over some tricks of using the selection tool? Currently, I just use it to take out different tracks without any waveform. Um, you know, so when you're using kind of, you know, the selection tool here, there's lots of great stuff. So one is to be able to, uh, you know, I want to do a fade in. I want to resize the events. I want to do a fade out. I wanted to resize the end of the event if I, you know, switch this to object moves contents. Like I said, I want the, this ending to automatically kind of fall where it will, or this beginning, I need it, this beginning to start right here. And then we could resize, or we could say, okay, I wanted to do sizing applies time stretch. So we could just stretch the audio or the MIDI contents uh, just by resizing. If I wanted to uh, come over here and just grab uh, you know, my volume envelope, we could do that. If I wanted to split notes, I could hold down Alt or Option plus and just click in the lower part. If I wanted to, you know, make copies of an event, I could just drag it by the center edge or we could hold down Alt while going to the bottom right hand corner and we'll see it turn into a pencil. I'll just zoom in here so it's a little easier to see. And then I could just kind of drag over the event as well. Let me see if I had the right modifier key. Um, and if I wanted to just come over here and slip the content within the parts, we could do that by holding down uh, Alt or Option or Alt plus control or command plus option. So lots of great stuff that you could do with the object selection tool. So if you wanna select non-contiguous events, you can hold down control. So all sorts of great things to do. So let me know if that's helpful, Jazzy Lomel. So your Heartbreak Time Machine says, today's stream has been full of little gems, Greg. Thank you, so you're welcome. We just answer, we try to, you know, make people, you know, whatever p questions people have, we'll try to show good ways of making it work better for them. But glad you're finding lots of helpful things. All right, um, all right, so we see from uh, Patrick, says, uh, yes, I watched the video of the mushroom bit. Um, I'm very slow in mixing. How much time will pros take to mix in Cubase? I know I can make it because uh, it's my third song on Cubase, but I just wanna know how do they do. Um, it varies, you know, I've seen some people do mixes incredibly fast. Um, like my friend Elliot Shiner, who's probably like, you know, one of the, probably the most respected mixing engineer in the world. Uh, you know, like I remember him telling me like he did, uh, I think it was in 1997. I was just watching it again after Christine McVie's passing, but he did Fleetwood Mac's The Dance, like their reunion concert. And, you know, he mixed that, he mixed a whole concert in one afternoon, uh, you know, like, you know, for, you know, like one of the biggest selling concert DVDs in, Warner Brothers history. Um, so, you know, some people will work, you know, it seems like a lot of people will work, you know, it's a similar answer I get from composers is like, when do you stop? 
And it's just like, you know, when someone tells me to stop, you know, because you could go on and tweak stuff forever and ever. Sometimes, you know, just, you know, if you want to get stuff done, realize that, you know, you have infinite possibilities. And people would just say that a mix was, you know, people would say that a mix was done when uh, they ran out of time. You know, um, my friend, I was watching a video interview with my friend Bobby Summerfield. Uh, who did a lot of work on like Paul Simon's Graceland and is an amazing engineer and super smart guy. Uh, and he always says mixes are never done or just abandoned. Um, so, but you will get fast. Um, some people work faster. Some people work slower as long as you get a great result at the end and you have the time and budget to do it. No one cares. You know, the, the end result is it sounds good. Some people will mix fast some people will take one song and have a hard time with it, and some people can do it, you know, in one tenth of the time and come out with, you know, different results that are both equally good. So it really depends. So don't don't kill yourself if you're, you know, worry if you have your client screaming at you and they want their mix done now. That that's when that's when you need to hurry up. So. All right, um, so we see a question from Max Storm. Uh, Hi, Greg, I have a live recording stereo with a song in 6A. Can you demonstrate the following? Uh, make a proper tempo detection, make chord recognition, uh, correct timing to add arpeggiator FX. So I may not have a 6A example, but I'll just kind of show you the same stuff here. So let's come over. All right, so let's say we're here. All right, so there's no correlation with a click and what's going on here. So what I'm gonna do is, again, go to project. And let's go to tempo detection. So we'll just come here, tempo detection. All right, and I'll do an offbeat correction. Now this had a pickup note in it. So what I want to do now is just come over here, find a downbeat. So whether it's in six, eight or four, four, um, you know, when we do this, Cubase kind of figures out what the, what the beat is. So we'll say, okay, this is where my four, four or where my six, eight starts. All right, so now I'm going to add a chord track. I'm going to drag this up. Okay, and I'm going to add a synth part here. So let's go ahead and add an instrument track. And we'll put it on Retrolog. All right, and all right, so say, and I'll just kind of find a So now I'm going to take this and put an arpeggiator on it. That's a good sound. All right, and I'm going to set this to six eighth notes.
So you could do stuff like that, and it's probably not the best combination of material, but I think you could, uh, you know, find the tempo. Um, you could then find the chords of the audio and then get an instrument and sync the arpeggio and realize that the MIDI plugin is going to sync with the tempo that was extracted originally from the track. And whether that's in a 4-4 or 6-8, you could be able to do it uh, basically with the same concepts. So let me know if that's helpful. All right, I see Madge Deepers is appreciative of Michael Teams' ice cream contribution. So, all right. All right, so we see Graham Witcher hasn't had much time for music. We really hope everything, you have some time to get everything settled in over the holidays. All right. Um, so we see we need freeze editing after freezed audio in Windows 7 support. Um, so if you wanted to edit the audio, you know, part of the allure of freezing parts was that it would, um, you know, actually not be able to be edited and affected. So if you have a situation where you want to be able to edit your parts, so let's say if I come here, you know, just do a render in place instead, and then you have free control to edit and, you know, probably a little more flexibility. So if I wanted to come here, so let's say if I just go to edit and we will choose to do uh, a render in place. So I'll just say, so then we could have the audio file and then the MIDI, you know, we could still edit everything. So if you want it to be able to edit and have that flexibility, just do a render in place. Um, and then I see um, we need Windows 7 support. So there's a lot of people still running Cubase on Windows 7. I'm not sure if the new licensing works, but Microsoft doesn't even support Windows 7 anymore. So as we want to deliver solutions that are working, you know, because it's, two operating systems behind the company that created it doesn't support it anymore. Um, so I know that, you know, a lot of people were doing stuff in Windows 7 with Cubase 11. I'm not sure if um, Cubase 12 will work on it with new licensing or not. Um, but, you know, it's, I think Windows 7 is, you know, I used it for years and loved it. And, you know, I moved on when Microsoft chose to drop support for it as well. All right. Great to see Best Green Jesus on. Glad you can make it. All right, um, all right, sorry, my chat field just jumped. All right, uh, so we see from Patrick, uh, do composers uh, use iterative quantization? While I hear some things I hear, it's like perfect on a grid and I'm not hearing it correctly, or do they use uh, I iterative quantize for everything they do? You know, so different composers will do different things in, um, you know, depending on a particular situation. So sometimes they may want something to be very free and not to be quantized at all. Sometimes when you're doing particular parts, like maybe you're doing string parts and you're going, da, 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 you know, they may put in like Alan Silvestri is a big proponent of, he's not a great keyboard player. You know, he's a drummer, but he does like, he's a mean step sequencer. 
So you, you can do a lot of stuff in step sequencing. So a lot of guys win those really fast string runs or like, da -da -da, you know, like those 30 second note string runs that we hear in big action films. Those might be done, you know, all directly in step input. Um, you know, so it's, you know, I think a lot of composers may just use, you know, iterative quantization because it's turned on by default. Um, so, but, you know, if you're trying, it could really depend on the source material as well. Sometimes the differences in the placement between 80% of the beat to the beat, you know, may be so subtle that a lot of people don't pick up on it. Um, I know Teddy Riley is one, um, you know, he's invented new jack swing so in his cubase projects you know he's like when he first got into cubase when he switched to cubase years ago and I, I remember going down to his studio and all he did is you know i waited like a half hour for him to show up and he comes in by himself and he just played a phrase and he's like okay we're just gonna play it back and he's like Oh, that's exactly how I played it. And to him, those little subtle differences between how he played ahead of the beat, behind the beat in different areas, that was the whole basis of New Jack Swing. And he found that the other tools he was using when he do that was kind of auto quantizing it. And it wasn't, and he was going crazy with another program when they kept telling him, it's like, no, no, it's exactly what he's doing. He's like, no, I didn't play that. He's like, no, no, it's, that's what you played. He's like, no, I didn't play that. So his whole thing was when he played it in, he wanted that particular feel. So, you know, for different artists and, and different genres, it can make a difference. Um, so, but I think a lot of people may just, when they do quantizing, may have it on iterative quantize by default and may not realize they're doing it or find that the results are pleasant enough and get and and corrects what they want to and still leaves it musical. All right. All right. So we see that Madge Deepers is warming up nicely now with all the nuggets of knowledge. So thanks for letting me know. My wife is always cold, so I, I, I'm always very cognizant of that and you know, give her warm teas throughout the day so she's not cold. All right, so we see Michael Pierce is going to get his soup brain on, so that'll be good for the cold weather. See, Patrick says, I wish one day to become a great composer, and I will thank Greg for helping me. So uh, that's very kind. It's always great to see people that I've worked with have gone on to do, like, incredible work, and it's a, it's a real thrill. See, Gareth is whipping up a storm with those Hallian layers. All right. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. All right, um, so I see when opening plugins on a channel, any way to set up that plugins never open on top of each other? All right, so let's say, um, so let's say I have a bunch of plugins here. So I think if I open up all the plugins, so I think if we position them in a way, so let's say if I position these and now I close all the plugins, that those plug-in positions will be retained. So I'll open them again. So it's whatever they were kind of last uh, opened to. And if you want to know like kind of what the magic keyboard shortcut, I always forget this, is Alt or Option plus Shift and click on the Edit Channel Settings. And then you could open up all of the insert plugins on that particular track. So it seems like it retains the last position that the plugin was opened in for that particular track.
All right, reading through comments. All right, um, so we have a from Gareth. Is there an undo in Howlian? So let's go ahead and take a look. Um, so let's say if I am. Let's say if I am here. All right, so let's say I've done the immortal sin and I've totally messed everything up here. Um, so there is undo right here. So we could just, uh, so if I've made adjustments, I think it's maybe 10 levels of undo. So as we work with this, um, and let me add an instrument. And let's adjust this. Let's go to our mix. So now we go to edit here. Uh, it unloaded the instrument. So, um, and again, I think if we go to options, um, there might be a number of edits but there is i think 10 levels of undo let's see if it's so but just use these and then you have redo as well gareth i remember one company complaining about vst plugins that you couldn't undo and i'm like oh that's wrong I think Graham has a good point about weather, about people comp that, you know, cold weather, just like when people, you know, were younger years ago. So having a frosty December, it's just probably when you're, and it's a great point that when you're kids, you don't worry about the heating bill as much. All right. Um, okay, Gareth wants to multi-layer that like. All right. All right. Uh, so we see in MIDI, delete overlaps mono versus delete overlaps poly. All right. Let me see. Okay, I haven't played with that, but let's see if we can get it figured out. Okay. Okay, so let's try polyphonic. And let me join these together. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna split this. All right, and let's say I have these two overlapping and I'll make this one. Let me just change the pitch on those. So it's, so that it's further down and out of the way visually. Okay, so I have these overlapping. So at this point, now we'll get to MIDI to functions and delete overlaps, poly.
Let's try the mono as well. So I haven't worked with that particular function. Let me just see if it's... I could look it up and uh, show it on Tuesday's live stream. But let me see if I drag this one over top. If we delete... Yeah, I'm not sure what that function is, but I'll, I'll do some research and we could show that on Tuesday's live stream. Sorry about that, Ari. All right. Um, so I just see from Sydney Thurston, um, I'm afraid I may need a little more context because this might have been 50 minutes ago, uh, of uh, what was that button you hit before you played the notes? So if you could remind me what that was, um, then I'd be happy to kind of uh, see if I could figure it out. But sorry, it's been a while since. All right. Um, so question, uh, is there a key command to close the in place editor MIDI? Uh, I can open it, but not close it. So I think it's, um, control or command shift plus I, and then the same key command to open and close it. So control or command plus shift and the letter I for in place and that opens and closes the in place editor. So let me know if that's helpful. All right. Um, all right. So we have a question from Spy Girl. Um, so it says, "Question: My last tried to make anyone understand. I cannot use the draw automation tool on the audio channel because I don't get the blue line. You do it, and I can't." Uh, many have this question. Um, so not, maybe it's not in Cubase twelve AI. A, a, you know, LE version with the clip gain, you know, so if you wanted to do this, um, I don't think I have, um, an LE or AI version installed. So it may not be in the lighter versions. Um, I could, if you want to email me a club cubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I don't have an LEAI version installed, unfortunately, but um, I could have it installed for uh, Tuesday's live stream. But if you want to email me um, at club cubase at steinberg.de, I could get the um, LEAI elements version installed, and then we could. Uh, I'd be happy to see if it's in that version. It may not be in that version. It may be in, in like Artist and Pro. All right. Um, so, hi, how come uh, that my version Cubase still shows 12.05, but I have updated to the latest version? Um, so it is 12.05, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think I updated to the latest hotfix myself, uh, but when you come over here on the Mac, you can see about Cubase Pro or under the help menu, I think in the Windows. Um, but, you know, see if it's, it'll probably say 12.052 if you have the latest hotfix. I, I haven't done it yet myself. I'm just been busy with other work stuff. Um, but let me know if you see it on the about screen there. All right, Jazzy Lamel asks, uh, hey Greg, I'm trying to find a way to take an audio track of a vocal and convert it 
to MIDI notes and then assign it to a virtual instrument to be played? Is there a way to do that? So yeah. Um, so like, let's say I wanted to, um, so if I was here, and we could do this through very audio. So I'm gonna revert this project quickly. All right, so I want to take this, we'll go into very audio, we'll edit our very audio. All right, and then under the very audio, we'll see functions, choose functions, and we'll say extract MIDI. Uh, and then we could just, we could include, you know, different pitch bend data to kind of mimic that. So we'll say, okay. Um, and I want to create a new MIDI track. And I'll come over here. So once we do this, it's now in MIDI and you could play it back through any device. So within the very audio editor, so double click, you want to enable very audio, make sure that the edit very audio is on from the functions, come here and then extract MIDI. And then you could choose to put on a selected track or a new MIDI track, just like that. All right. All right. Um, all right. So we see, uh, hey, Greg, sometimes it's hard to find the question that you're reading and answering. Is it possible when you read the question that you say the time the question was posted first? Um, I'll try to do it periodically, but this is at, uh, at my time, 2.16 p.m., so an hour, 16 minutes into the live stream. Michael Teen says, Picardy thirds. That may be spelled wrong, but I went to music. I have a degree in music for something, some reason. Anyway. All right. So we see uh, Wonder in Oz says Dutch Heritage made us look, wake up early this morning. His wife wanted to see the soccer match in the Netherlands to Argentina. Yeah, I was watching Brazil and Croatia. That was a really good, really good match. And I thought the Netherlands did really played incredibly well against the United States. So congratulations. All right, so we see from Noah, um, sorry, I'd like to be, and this is about the, um, selecting the 16th notes and he wants the um, third note from each quarter. Okay. Let's see if we could create something like that. And this is like selecting the third note before. Let me do something in 4-4. Four, four. Thank you for all the great questions from everyone.
All right. Um, so, um, all right. So it says, I would like to be more clear. I'm at the third note from each quarter. If I have in a four sixteenth notes, four sixteenth notes in a quarter, I would like to select only the third. All right. So let me just set this to okay so let's say okay so if we want to select only the third 16th note so let's see if we could do this all right Okay, so let's say we want to do type is equal to notes and we want length to be equal to, let's say, a 16th note. So I'm not sure if it's every 16th note. Um, and then let's say Last event. Okay, so let's see if we just select it here. All right. So it looks like it did it there, but not. All right, so let's say if I. Okay, so try a different approach. All right, let's try changing this to position inside um, bar range. So you might be able to just, you know, come over here and say, okay, I want these notes to be like here. And then we'll insert, and then we can say position is inside bar range. And then we could say, okay, this is going to be, or this, and let me just, uh, so we'll say position, position, and I'll just say inside bar range. So 
So if we just kind of choose like the third 16th note of each beat, you might be able to do stuff like that. And let's, uh, let's say if I wanted this to select that you can set up within that particular ones, but I could play with it a little more and see if I get it more refined with a logical editor. But if you want to email me just a quick part that I could look at, that would be helpful. And you can send it to club cubase at Steinberg, uh, de. All right, we have Mark Winslow saying aloha from Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so we see um, question. Is it possible to set a picture to an external MIDI instrument on the media tab? Um, so currently th there isn't a way to do it. Um, you know, it's just going to be for plugins, but what you can do is come over here to the actual tracks itself. And if you wanted to have, you know, a particular instrument, you could load up even your own, you could take pictures and load up the instruments here, but external instruments, you know, these, these are for like, you know, all the different VSTs. Um, so there isn't a way to see like your external instruments with an in, with a um, with a picture here, so not that I know you might be able to hack something, but I, I, it's not designed to do that. So. Okay, we see John M. Tobin sent a question in email. So, all right, um, all right. So we have a question for Patrick. Uh, do lanes follow if I move? The lane, Greg, I don't want to follow. Uh, what can we do that? Um, so if we have lanes, so we'll come over here. Um, let me just revert. All right, so let's say we have our audio here. Um, so do lanes follow if I move the lane, Greg? So, you know, if we move the event, if we move, you know, like right now we have all these different elements as, you know, as all of our lanes here. So, you know, if we move the audio, all of the lanes within them will move, you know, but if we wanted to, uh, you know, so that contains all the lanes, but if we open up the lanes here, you know, we can choose to, you know, move these. These would be collective because it's going to be kind of recorded often at the same time in a cycle record. But if I wanted to turn these into actual audio tracks, I could select the lanes like so, right click and then turn them into, uh, we could say, uh, create tracks from lanes. And now all the lanes have been mapped out to just normal audio tracks that can all be moved independently and they're just white because they are muted. So now these can be moved freely. So let me know if that's helpful. All right. Um, so John M. Tobin, he had emailed this in. We'll get to a little bit later. It says uh, track enables. I thought I replied by email, but I'll show it in, in the live stream. Um, Track enable and uh, read write is grayed out when creating new tracks in the existing project. Inspector still shows them. All right, so if we have um, like our track controls, so one of the things that you could do is you see, if you look right here, so we could say, okay, um, I may not see like, you know, different functions here. So let's say, 
it's really subtle, but we have different uh, presets between track controls. So if I switch this to simple, then I don't really see all of my track controls. But if I click here, we can say, okay, I want this to be standard. I want recording. I want it to be mixing. So we could have, just by clicking here, our different track controls are visible. So we have different controls here than what we see there. When we right click, you could also go to track control settings and you could pick and choose what elements are visible. So generally if something like was there that wasn't, I would just simply click here and maybe load the standard uh, controls and see if they will appear or right click on the track and go to track control settings. And again, you say, oh, I want to freeze over. You could just move those particular elements from hidden controls to visible controls. And you do this for each of the different tracks. So let me know if that's helpful, John. All right, so we have a question. Um, uh, can you explain a bit different algorithms we have available? I know the general stuff, but never really understood in what cases should we change it manually? Very audio use example, maybe. Um, so um, when we have our different algorithms for stretching, so you know, as Cubase has grown, there's been algorithms that have been added. So when we look at different algorithms, so we have standard algorithms, and these are you know older algorithms, um, and often will be you know, um, and we maintain these for compatibility, uh, and then probably the elastic are higher quality algorithms. Um, so these are broken into three different categories. So we're going to have um, efficient. So this will be more CPU efficient. So if you're doing like a real-time time stretching across 600 live tracks and your computer was starting to bog down, maybe switch to efficient. Uh, if you were doing informant preservation, you know, like when you would speed up or slow down a recording and the voice sounds much different, like, you know, almost going from female to male or male to female, something like that, you know, that could be based on the formants. So, you know, if you are doing a... A, a you know if you're doing stretches you know stretching audio in real time and you notice that the vocal character like the vocal character is changing that you could preserve the formats and then we have the regular elastic pro which will be set up for um the, the default algorithms so now there's within each of these there's time pitch and tape so time, we could think of it as being for more rhythmic uh, material. Pitch, we could think of it as more like harmonic based of vocals, maybe saxophones, different instruments, um, guitars, bass. You might want to do pitch. And then we have tape, and tape mimics an analog tape machine. So if you're in tape mode and you slow down the tempo, the audio changes pitch as well as the length, just like an analog tape machine would do. So, um, so that way you could do kind of very speed effects. So again, we have kind of formant preservation, standard and efficient. So, uh, and then we have ones that favor rhythmic, one that fav favors harmonic content, and one that will work kind of like the same paradigm is very speed on an analog tape deck. So that's what tape does.
All right, so we see Best Green Jesus. Just said, wow. So wish I knew what it was for, but I'm glad you liked it, Best Green Jesus. All right. All right. Um, so we see, uh, Greg, is there a way to select all MIDI comping parts and delete overlap because it's more than six? All right, so let me just create uh, a part here. Wait, this, sorry. All right, so I'll just do a quick MIDI recording here. And I'll switch. Okay, so let's say. All right, so I have a number of different parts. So let's just say if I <clears throat> go to preferences and let's go to editing and if we have delete overlaps enabled. So now if I come over here so then we could delete the overlaps on MIDI stuff. So just again, come over here to preferences, to editing, and then you could enable delete overlaps right there. And if you want it to like merge all those together, so let's say I had a number of different parts that were merged. Um, all you had to do is grab the glue gun and hold down Alt or Option, and then we could take all of those parts and merge them like that if needed. All right, so Michael Pierce has generated his soup recipe. Uh, cider and onion, butter and softened onions, garlic, then bottle of UK cider plus potato and thyme, simmer, stock simmer, and potato cooked cream blend topped with mel melted cheese toast. So, sounds great. Thanks for sharing. i warm up everyone who's suffering from cold weather. Reading through comments. All right, Madge Deeper says she's learning a lot tonight. And thank you, Greg. So you're welcome. Thanks, thanks to all the people asking great questions. They're the ones that are really responsible. I just kind of show what people ask. All right, so we see Spike Williams is just bought a house in is it Rhonda Valley? Can't wait to move. Perfect recording environment and inspirational landscape. Congratulations. Hope everything works out with your new house and studio. So Graham Witcher's just saying just how wonderful Greg Christine McVie and Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, that was I was really really sad to read of that. So I got to meet her once with Stephen Nix at a Fleetwood Mac concert because I was friends with uh, Bob Welch, who is the guitarist before uh, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks joined the group. So it was kind of a lot of fun. And Graham Witcher says the dance is just so absolutely wonderful. So yeah, I almost got to go to the taping of that, but I had to go home early from a trip to, to California. But a bunch of my coworkers got to go All right, 
reading through it. All right, so we see um, from Patrick, uh, it says an entire concert mixed in one afternoon on Cubase. Do you guys, uh, you mentioned all the Cubase to mix. Do mix engineers and sound engineers use Cubase? So, yeah, lots of people do. I think that might have been, um, that might have been pre-Cubase. It was probably 97. Um, so it was probably just when VST was just starting. So I think that might have been done with D88s, if I'm not mistaken. I know it was um, Elliot Shiner did it. And he did it in conjunction with uh, David Hewitt's truck, um, which is the old record plant remote. Um, and so, but, and David, David Hewitt had done everything inside of uh, Nuendo. And after like 2004, when I worked on the uh, Eric Clapton's Crossroads with him. All right. Um, so we see, uh, from Sydney, let me see if I can find a question. Sorry, just jumped on me. All right, my chat field just jumped. All right, so I think I'm back. Um, so from Sydney, Thurston. Hey, does Cubase have uh, cool jazz libraries like you played when messing with the ARP? Um, so there are some some elements. Um, you know, there's probably not a lot of loop content that's specifically for jazz. Uh, but if you got the, you know, within Groove Agent, there's some really nice uh, jazz libraries. Uh, one is like Jazz Essentials. Let me see if I have. I think I see if I have it installed. Uh, I don't have installed, but one of the ones you could also get is uh, Simon Phillips Jazz Drums. And these are always just, Simon's so great and such a wonderful guy. Uh, incredibly humble. But, you know, here you could actually have Simon Phillips's kit and say, okay, I just want to be able to. So now, okay, I just want to do patterns. And I want this to be more complex. So you actually have Simon Phillips, not only uh, his kit, but him playing. So so there's some really good, uh, you know, jazz drum stuff that come, that's available for Groove Agent. It may not come with it, but it is available. And it's a great option. So check out Jazz Essentials or the Simon Phillips Jazz Drums are really good and you know those are like the hardest parts to program authentically um when doing midi stuff in jazz so Okay, so we see from Hugo Stiggs, uh, is there a macro for making all my audio clips volume at zero? Uh, sometimes I notice that the volume is raised. Not sure why I had to manually clip gain them back to zero to avoid clipping. Thanks. All right, so let's take a look. Um, okay, let me just go over here where I have some more audio. Okay, so let's say if I have all these up, um, so let's see if I select a number of the channels here, um, and let's just go to volume and set it to zero, then that should negate all, any clip gain changes on any of the tracks. So let's say if I come here, and this is hotter, a little softer, I could select all these and we see the volume change, type in zero and hit enter and that will take it uh, back down to where it was originally. So give that a try, just select the event and you'll see the volume change here. 
So I don't know of a key command to do that, but you could select it and just do it from the info line and, and do that across multiple tracks, multiple events rather. Okay, so you see Michael Pierce is working on a live gig at the moment. All right. <laughs> Gareth wants me to keep the craziness. He'll turn it into a hot mess Xmas single. So. All right, um, how do we set the question from Best Screen Jesus? How do we set the root chord of a recently rendered sample? Does it allow for the root like others as well? So I think if we go into the media bay, um, so let's say, okay, I wanted to come here and let's come over here and I wanted to take um, the audio file. So let's say, okay, I want to take guitars. All right, and let's see if we scroll over. We could probably now at this point come over. So let's say we want to go to two. Um, let's see if we can find the root. Maybe under musical, let's see if we can find the root key. So yeah, so we see key. So right here we see the key. Um, so, and at this point, all right, so let's say if I, so let's say, okay, I want to go to this guitar part, um, and let me just open this up. So now when we are in our right hand zone here, uh, you should be able to, yeah, you can set the key directly here. So you could just, um, so you could set the key in the, in the file and then that way it could automatically go. So to set the, the root key, go to media bay, you can select the file. You could go to the right hand side. And if you don't see like the key, um, you could, you know, come over here and pick and choose like what exact, you know, so if we go to musical, um, you could set the key, but it looks like the key is enabled by default. And then you could just set the key from Media Bay for the event right there. And that should follow the project root key. All right. All right. Um, so Jazzy Lamel just asks, uh, says, hey, Greg, I think I made a mistake. I meant the highlight tool. Can you show some tricks and uses for it? So I'm not sure if the highlight tool is this tool, like the range tool. So like, um, so if I wanted to take like this bit of audio and let's say I wanted to delete it, so I don't have to necessarily cut it. I could just hit the backspace or delete key. Uh, if I wanted to, you know, take a portion of the audio that's selected and move it to there, or if I wanted to, Take a selection of multiple tracks and hold down the Alt or Option key. I can drag and move that over. Um, you know, let's say I wanted to come and hold uh, Control Shift, Control Command plus Shift plus X. I can do kind of like an edit where the time is deleted and the, the subsequent following events will will get automatically moved over. So we just delete that we could also do stuff where okay i wanted to select this and i wanted to erase everything before and after that selection that you could come over 
to uh, like if you go to edit to range there's lots of great stuff in here and then you could just come over and crop so let me know if that's the highlight tool that you're talking and referring to all right All right, so I sense a, a hot mess Christmas carol coming on here, inspired. I see Gareth and Michael collaborating here in real time. I see Gareth says four layers on Howley, and I'm already freaking out, so that's good. But the PC is fine, that's good. All right, so a question. Uh, when using compression in a master and a mixer, would it make a difference if you use it when mastering and using compression? Um, you know, so sometimes if you're going to take it into a mastering engineer, you know, not everyone has the benefit of saying, okay, I'm going to now work with a mastering engineer that, you know, you probably wouldn't do a heavy handed compression on the master bus. Uh, before handing it to a mastering engineer. And maybe if you're working with a mastering engineer, you can say, hey, do you want me to put any dynamics processing on it or do you want me to leave that to you? A lot of times a mastering engineer say, you know, if you don't, you know, like they would prefer to have control over that because they're kind of looking at it from a different perspective. Um, one analogy I heard was, you know, you can't unburn the steak, uh, which I, I thought was a good one. And so, you know, it's okay to, you know, put some compression on if you're just going to deliver it straight from Cubase. If you're going to send it to a mastering engineer or do different mastering, you may want to uh, leave the compression off at that point in Cubase and do it in the mastering stage. So if you're doing multiple songs, like for a CD or album release, that you could have consistency from track to track and make it sound cohesive. Uh, Valley, uh, can I set up a MIDI remote to work with third party VST synths like Vital? So, sure. And one of the cool things is once you have a particular MIDI remote, so let's say, okay, I wanted to go to uh, this MIDI remote here. So, let's say, okay, I'm gonna let's say go to my Choice Sauce controller. One of the cool things is, you know, we could say, um, we could lock a particular function here. So let's say I open up pad shop. All right, so I'm going to add an instrument track and we're going to make it pad shop and we'll add our track. All right, so now, you know, we have the ability to have this automatically control elements in pad shop when pad shop is the active window and if i switch to like an audio track now the audio track is an act is the active component here so i come to this and i could have my quick controls automatically controlling different elements in pad shop but if i wanted to lock it um i could just say now when i go to a different track Regardless, I could have one dedicated controller of quick controls that's just operating pad shop regardless of whatever is selected. So we could lock a, a MIDI remote. So one MIDI remote could just be for dedicated for a particular instrument if you wanted to. Or if you wanted to the focus quick controls to go on what is the focused window, whether it's going to be the track controls or plug-in parameters, whatever is the actively selected window. But if you wanted it to lock and be dedicated to one particular instrument, you could do that just by locking the MIDI remote control and locking the focus right here with the padlock. All right, so we see a question. Um, I know that plugins retains the last position, but I wonder if there's a way, uh, perhaps a Cubase preference that prevents me from ever needing to move them in the first place. Um, 
So I think the, the concept is that they open the plugin in the center of the window by default so that it's visible kind of regardless of like your screen resolution, regardless of, you know, where it was initially. So I think the initial state opens up in the center of the screen so that it will all, you know, so it's not hidden and unexpected the first time you open it up. So I don't think that there's a preference there, but I think that that is a sensible approach to it so that, you know, when you open up a plug-in window, it's not, you know, if you have a second screen that's turned off, it's not opening on a second screen that's turned off, stuff like that the first time you use it. So, but I don't know of a particular preference to do that. So I think the default state of opening in the center where, where it is known to be visible and then being able to adjust after makes sense. According to Gareth, I am his eyes, and he needs a 66-inch monitor. So, All right, wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer on. So from Mission Viejo, California, thanks for joining us. All right, Michael Teams wants people to like, 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 smash that like button. So I'll concur with him. See comment from Graham Witcher just thinking uh that how wonderful a vocalist Andy Williams was. Yeah, I was listening to some of his Christmas stuff and I remember Donny Osmond telling me stories of that's where he kind of made his debut on an Andy Williams show when he was like four or something like that. So I am sharing, telling me about that. It's really fun. Jazz Dude just says there's only one goal in life. Master Cubase to know ninety percent of its options slash features. All right. That'll, that'll keep me unemployed, so. All right, wonderful to see John Costigan on. Don't know if I said hi to him earlier. All right, so Patrick just says, uh, Greg, you said you make coffees for your wife. I remember philosophy says people chase four things, money, power, pleasure, fame. Instead, if we choose family first and work and faith, we'll be more happy than others. So, yeah, I think that if I had, you know, other things, uh, you know, I just realized other things don't make me happy. So I'm like super happy being at home with my family and being able to help people out. So, and just feel incredibly fortunate to have such a wonderful wife and son. All right. All right. So we have uh, Tony um, Hintika just asked an opinion on MetaGrid Pro iPad app for controlling Cubase. Have you tested it? So I haven't worked with it. So I know that there's lots of people that, you know, love all the different apps and, you know, they get into it and start you know, really deep diving into remote control in Cubase. So I know there's lots of people that use Metagrid, maybe other people, um, maybe other people could comment if I haven't personally used it, maybe other people could, uh, who, who do use it could comment on how they like it. All right. So we see Uno Memento just saying Brazil is out of the World Cup finals and soon Argentina too. So yeah, yeah I was shocked with Brazil, so, but. I thought they had it, you know, in overtime with a goal. So, but, but, uh, you know, Croatia played well. All right. So, no, will send me file. Thanks for that. All right. Wonderful to see Sable Winters on. Thanks for joining us. All right, question. Uh, is the Halion Sonic SE works with e-licensor? Because when I start Halion in Cubase 12 Pro, it's completely empty. There's no sound in it. Uh, there's a minus sign. I reinstall it already. Still the same. So Halion Sonic SE does work with the new Steinberg licensing under under 
uh, you know, with Cubase 12. Um, so the Halion, <clears throat> the full version of Halion and Halion Sonic are still on e-licensor. They'll be migrating soon uh, when it's kind of when it's being worked on as we speak. Um, but currently, the Halion Sonic SE Pro. Now, if you had a previous version of Halion Sonic SE and you didn't download the version for Cubase 12 from this from the uh, Steinberg Download Assistant. You may have you may need to install the latest version under the you know Cubase 12 download assistant. So if you're still using the Halion Sonic SE version from Cubase 11, that would require the USB E licensor, whereas the one that is installed with version 12 uh, will use the new Steinberg licensing. All right, wonderful to see Jackshot Records from British Columbia. I'm glad you could join us. All right. Um, all right. Sorry, my chat field just jumped. Okay. Question: uh, Is there a way to make a macro for fade in and fade out similar to? The increase fade in and fade out, where you can set the length and time of the increase decrease. Um, so what you can do. So let me just I'll just put this on a new project. Thanks for all the wonderful questions from everyone. All right. Just. All right, so let's say I have <clears throat> this. All right, so what you can do is, let's say I want to nudge cursor. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to set my quantize here to quarter note. You know, if, so let's say our cursor is here. One of the things you could do is, let me just see if it's, So if we have the beginning of a file, so let's say if I have a selection here, um, you could hit A and that would do a fade to range. And then if you nudge, so let's say, so if you have a range selection, you could just do well it's you know you could create it as a macro but it may not speed up your time so let's say if i just have a range of time selected and then i'm at the beginning and hit a that will automatically the letter a like apple like it just fades to range that i could just hit the left and right arrows and hit the letter a so you know let me know if that could work for your workflow so this way I could just adjust and, you know, so, but you might have to set like just the actual file, but let's say if I move my playhead, let me just uh, find a key command for under transport. So I could nudge. Okay, so let's say if I'm here, 
Yeah. So if you have like a selection with the range tool and then hit A, let me know if that is helpful because then you could just say, okay, I want to fade to here. Um, and then you could kind of do different fade in and fade outs kind of based upon the particular range. While it's not a macro that could speed up kind of your workflow process with that. All right, so we have a question from uh, Bobby B-Sides. Uh, sorry, I'm new. Where do I find Vary Audio? Thanks. All right, so all you have to do to find Vary Audio is you could uh, double-click on an audio event, and then you'll see the Vary Audio tab here. And then at that point, you'll be able to click on Edit Vary Audio. Now we'll do the analysis and create the segments. So double-click on the file. You'll have in, That will switch to the sample editor. You'll see the very audio tab at the top. Click on edit very audio, and then it'll do its analysis and, and determine the pitch, and then you could do the editing like that. All right, uh, so we have a question. Can I extract MIDI from a hi-hat loop? So. Yeah, so let me just come over here. Just see if I can. All right, let me just see if I can find a quick hi hat loop. All right, so say if I want to do this, I could. All right, so say I have my hi-hat here. So I could now just double click and let's go to hit points. And I'm gonna go ahead and just open up a quick instance of, let's say Groove Agent SE. Okay, so let's say I want to put this on F sharp one. So I'm going to come and let's take this and I'm going to go to hit points. So we'll say, okay, we want to edit hit points. And now we'll, we'll see this little create tab. Let's create um, MIDI notes. So I want to assign these to F sharp one. All right, and I'm just going to select this track. So create MIDI notes. F sharp one, hit okay. And now, so again. So that's how you could do quick hi-hat loops. All 
All right, so you see from John Tobin, uh, unfortunately, this time not helpful. I did all you suggested prior to tonight. I just had to reload all channels to new blank project. Just don't know how it happened. So I'm not sure if that's after you showed it to me or not, or after I showed you. All right, uh, so we see a question from Robotic. Um, how to remove Halion VST from track? Okay, so if it's an instrument track, so let's say if I add a Halion um, Sonic SE, so I'll just come here, we'll add our Halion Sonic SE. All right. Um, so that instrument track is automatically tied to that particular instrument. So at this point, if I want it, to get rid of that track, all you'd have to do is say no VST instrument. Um, and, or, you know, so, at, and at that point, we could, when we see this, it's not routed to anywhere. So if I want it to take that particular data and then route it to pad shop, I could come here and then just move that particular materials. If I wanted to remove the, the track with an instrument track I could come here and remove the track and that will remove the instrument from the side there All right, uh, so we see from Donald Letcher, uh, Greg, after creating an expression map where key switch colors are automatically assigned in the editor view uh, with articulations visible, all the key switch articulation events are the same color. All right, so let's take a look at it. Let me just look for a project here. Okay, this one. Okay, so let me look at my note expression here. So. So let's see if I come here and now let's just draw in some different expressions. All right, so it all looks to be kind of the same color there. Yeah, so it looks like it's the same color here. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything obvious. Yeah, it looks like it's the same color for me too. Um, I'll make a note of that and see if I could get it figured out for Tuesday's live stream. Sorry about that. There may be some reasoning, reasoning behind that, um, but it seems like it's not carrying over the colors. So, uh, but if you want to send me an email, just as a reminder to clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'll take a look at it on Tuesday's live stream. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to have a LFO control the tempo track? 
So generally, I don't think so because generally the LFO is based on the tempo track. It's always going to be kind of derived the timing from the tempo track itself. So for the, you know, um, so for the LFO to control the tempo track when they, when the tempo track is the basis for the timing of the LFO could be tricky. Um, but let me know if there's like anything in particular you want to do with the LFO, you know, as under the tempo track. All right, so Nick is so-called in Essex in the UK. He's asked Uber to deliver everyone an Irish coffee. And delivery times may vary, so sounds good. All right. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, is it better to sidechain via FX or group tracks? Um, so it doesn't really matter. Most people use FX channels, um, you know, but I think either area can, you know, you can get the same result, get to the, you could get to the finish line either way uh, without any consequences between the two. All right, we have a question from Sable Winters. Uh, easiest way to apply effects to slices, move or copy or slice down to a fresh track. All right, so um, I think like the offline processing is good for this. So let me see if I have, um, to do, all right, so let's take a look. All right, so let's say at this point, um, got this loop here. All right, so let's say it, you know, I want to, we'll slice this up. So I'm gonna come over to, and let's adjust my threshold down a little bit. And let's go ahead and create slices. All right, so now we'll take this into our part editor. All right, so let's say I want to take my, I want to take the snare and let's see if we could do this. I haven't tried this in the part editor, but let's just say, okay, I want to put a reverb on the snare. So yeah, so at this point, um, when we double click, then we can just select the event here. Um, and if we wanted to come over to process, so let's go to audio and say plugins and let's say, okay, now I just wanted to put uh, a delay on the slice. So let's say, okay, let's do a mod machine and we'll just do a new version of that. So now as we listen to this, we could process, we could, you know, process different um, types of processing here. So let's say, now when I hit F7, um, I just wanted to add more reverb to that. So as we, 
So that way, you know, once you select the event here in the sample editor after it's been sliced, at that point you could um, just do offline processing. Or if you take the slice into Groove Agent, you could put different uh, effects on different pads there as well. So let's say if I wanted to do this kind of via Groove Agent, um, so. Okay, I want to take this, let's drag the loop over, I'll select instrument, so we'll drag this over, and let's create slices. So we'll come over to um, slice, create our slices, So now, so I could take this pad and let's say I wanted to throw, go to the mixer and I wanted to add uh, a reverb onto this. So we'll make it a reverence. And so now on my snares, I wanted to come over to edit and then we'll go to the amp and we'll say, okay, we'll see our aux sends here. So say, okay, now I wanted to add. And let me just go back to the mixer, make sure I have this right. Okay, we'll go to the aux sends here, sorry. And then let's put the reverb here. Okay, and now. So I'll go to select the pad and under edit, go to amplifier, and then you could come over here. And let's say I wanted to put a different reverb on this. So let's say I want this to be, um, our time to be shorter. So, and we'll put this on aux send two. So we'll come back, select this one. I'll get an aux send two. And now if I played the pattern, um, so say. So that you could do it in Groove Agent or you could do it manually, just going to the sample editor, double clicking and go to hit points, create slices. And once you do that, you kind of break apart the individual events and they're collected together in a part editor. And then you could select the individual part and do processing on it or take it to Groove Agent. So two different approaches there, Sable. My chat field just jumped on me. Okay. All right, uh, so we see from Emmanuel Morin. Um, hello, Greg, uh, Cubase 9.5 Pro on Windows 10. I don't use Control Room, but why does Cubase remember my audio connections uh, dash output after opening a second or third file? Um, all right, so I'm not sure if it's not remembering the output or if it is remembering the output. So if it was, if the other files were saved with different output routings and connections, often that's gonna be preserved in the project. Um, it says I don't use control room, but why does Cubase remember my audio connections output after opening a second or third file? So let me know, Emmanuel, if it's not remembering them or maybe that you had different audio 
um, setups and maybe they weren't saved with the new audio setups. All right, so we see Camille checking in from Czech Republic. All right, uh, so we see a question uh, from Jackshot Records follow up. My hope with the macros was to select multiple events and add fade in, fade outs to all of them and be able to increase it uh, with repeating the macros. All right, so let's take a look at like a multi track thing. All right. Okay, so let's say I just wanted to take like all of these tracks. Um, so let's say I have like a range selection across all of these and then I hit A. Um, so let's say if, I, if I'm doing it from the beginning and then as I adjust the range, I could just hit A and we could just do that for multiple tracks so let's say if I wanted to extend the range here and there's I'm remembering the keyboard shortcut for but you could just extend the range with different keyboard shortcuts uh, using the nudge and then hit a again so you know so you could do the do the same thing for multiple uh, or single files so let me know if that's helpful All right, you see Nick has to take off, so thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, all right, so we see a follow up from uh, Gerald Ely he says to follow up on the LFO slash tempo track question. I want to add variance to the tempo to add a more human feel to a MIDI drum loop. You know, so there's lots of other ways. I'm not sure if that would actually get you there if it's kind of constantly changing. I mean, not necessarily through like an LFO, but you know, if you do just, you know, even if you wanted to just let's say we have a tempo track. You know, for MIDI loops, you know, one of the things that I would do is just, um, you know, if you have it on a MIDI track is, you know, if you go to, you know, there's a number of ways of doing this. One is, uh, you know, if we go to MIDI modifiers. So here you could actually take, you know, the different. Um, so let's say, okay, I wanted to. Um, I'll just we don't have to do it as a MIDI insert, so let's just get to MIDI modifiers here, and you know just randomize the position, and you know set this up to like you know plus or minus sixteen something like that, and play around with the position there and randomize it, so that would probably get you more of a human feel than you want than kind of constantly changing the tempo because if you've recorded other parts and those parts are in musical mode, those events will constantly be changing tempo, but it may not be Matt, but it may not be, you may not, you may want those parts to be straight against the groove of the MIDI drum. So try just taking the MIDI modifiers and, adjust, you know, try to randomize the position on a MIDI drum loop. And I think you'll get better results that way, Gerald. See, according to uh, Wonder and Oz, Netherlands just scored two to two in the last minute. So it sounds like the Croatia and Brazil match. I'm sure there's a lot of people upset in Brazil today.
All right. Um, so we see uh, from King Drew 562, is there a tool to keep you in key in terms of playing instruments? So we could do it for MIDI parts. Um, so once we have like, you know, a MIDI event here, you could go to the scale assistant and then we could just come over here and snap live input. Um, so there's nothing that's really allows you to, if you have a guitar part or a vocal part, um, to have that automatically snapping key. But for MIDI stuff, we could do it with the snap live MIDI input right there in the scale assistant. See, David M. just asking it's okay to ask his question again. So I'm sorry I missed your question, David. Um, but yeah, please feel free to ask your question. Sorry if I missed it. Let me see if I could scroll back and find it quickly here. Yeah, but David, please ask it again. Sorry about that. I um, saw so your comment about you don't have a cholesterol problem, so that's good. But yeah, please, please ask your question again. I'm sorry. My apologies. All right, so we see Sable's going to have to watch this Slice FX demo again. That was quite detailed. You open up new possibilities. And so, yeah, let me know if it's confusing, but there's a couple different ways to do it. All right, you see Gerald Ely is going to play with the MIDI modifiers. We'll see if David M. gets his question in. Let me see. I think we're at the end of live questions for now. I think I caught up. Let me see if I could scroll back and find it. Sorry about that, David. Scrolling back, I'm not sure how long ago it was. Yeah, going back to two ten PM. I don't see it. All right, we'll see if we can get David's question in. Uh, if not, I'll go ahead and go to some of the questions that were mailed in. All right, um, so we have, I see a question that just came in. Does anyone know how Cubase and Rendo runs using an Avid hardware interface like the MTRX Studio? Any issues to be aware of? Um, so I think if it's just like the IO portions that, that shouldn't be a problem as long as, uh, you know, they usually, I know in the past Avid would sometimes not enable all of the inputs and outputs on their audio interfaces, uh, with the core audio or ASIO driver, but I think it's probably going to be using, uh, core audio. So, um, so I don't, wouldn't anticipate any problems with that. If there's onboard DSP, like for powering plugins, it may not utilize that, but just for the IO and capturing shouldn't be a problem. All right. Uh, so a question from Val Lee, um, is there a possibility to get the same functions, uh, duplicate, copy, paste, jump with arrows between notes in the in place editor? I couldn't find one. All right. So let's take a look. I think, it would, I think it works the same, but I could be wrong. Okay. So let's say if I come here, All right, so you might have to select, but it looks kind of like everything. Um, so let's see if we want to, let's say if I cut out a bunch of notes here 
and I want to duplicate. So if I have these notes selected and hit, you know, Control or Command D, the duplicate works. Let's come over here. So it's copy, paste. That works. And the arrows between the different notes, that seems to be working. So it could be maybe there's another window, another track that has the focus. But, you know, if you're clicking in here, it looks like all those functions work with the in-place editor, just like that. So let me know if I'm doing something differently. And let me go close that. Just wait and see if David M's question uh, comes up real quick. If not, we'll I'll go ahead and move on to our questions, but I'll look for David's question uh, as soon as I get back. But let's go to some of the other questions that were sent in. And again, if you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. So we see that we're at 109 likes. Thank you so much. All right, um, so this is a question that was left. There's a comment on the last live stream. Uh, they were wondering if there's a way to flip the sends to faders in Cubase. And I said we could do it using utilizing the MIDI remote. Um, so let's show how to do that. So let's say if I want to open up kind of a bigger project. Um, all right, so let's come over here. Okay, so let's say we have a number of tracks. I'm going to add, um, let's say with my drums, I'm just gonna come over here, select all the tracks, and I'm gonna add an effects send to all the tracks. So let's say I wanna add an effects channel to the selected, or I'll just, let me just do it. Uh, I'll, I'll do it in the mix console lower zone. All right, so let's say I come here, and okay, so it looks like I have a uh, a plugin here already in in slot one. So if I wanted to come here, we could select uh, different plugins to go along. So so the concept was basically we see this in live sound consoles where instead of having to move like these faders that we want to turn like faders at the bottom or our MIDI remote surface into um, into actual to control the send levels. So so if we go into our MIDI remote, um, and I created this just using my Korg Nano control. So I made a new page, and we could do this on the the uh if we go to the mapping assistant so i'm taking basically the same controls that were set up and then i click on plus and then what i want to do is just create a new uh a new actual um page so this way i have one controller that does multiple aspects so I have this controller set up so on my fader on my controller i have eight knobs so when I come here, I have eight faders, all right? So, and this is typical, like, you know, we don't have necessarily, if we have 600 tracks, we don't expect 600 physical faders to control one. We would want to kind of bank back and forth. So what I did was on the particular fader, when we go to the mapping assistant, I wanted this fader to control the aux send one. So let's say if I go to my sends here, so we'll just come over to sends. So now I want this fader to control channel one. When I go to channel two, I want this fader to control the send level on volume one. And that seems, so let's show how to do that. So when we go to our mapping assistant again, we could come over to 
what we call our mix console. Now, since we have eight faders, eight physical faders, we could come over to our mixer bank zone and we could set the number of mixer channels that equals the number of channels that we have our physical controls. So I'm gonna go to select like volume one here, like this fader, and I'm gonna go to channels and we'll go to channel one and let's go to our send slots. So I'll say, we're gonna go to send one and I'm gonna assign the level to the fader. And then I assigned pre and post fader and enable to the buttons here. So when I hit this button, this turns on and off the, uh, turns on and off the send. I hit this button, it turns it to pre and post fader and the fader is actually controlling the send level. And I did this for when I go to, uh, to, to, to fader two, when we double click on that, we're gonna go to channel two and do the same thing. So we'll say our send slot, we're gonna do level, and then for channels, so we see eight channels listed here, but when we look at my project, I have, you know, uh, 66 tracks. So we can have eight channels at a time because that's how many faders we have. And what I've done is we come over to these two knobs and we set up these to do mixer banks. So we see when we go to our mixer bank zone, we go to actions. So we can say next and previous mixer bank. So if I wanna control channels nine through 16, I could hit this button and this would send me to the next mixer bank. And if I wanted to go back from one through eight, I hit this button, which is defined to my previous mixer bank. So now, as soon as I come over here and I go to this mapping page, I could, I start moving the faders and I'll just switch to the lower mix console here. So we can control and move the fader and then we're just controlling our particular send one here. So if I wanted to now come to this channel, I could turn, you know, so if I come right over here, let's go ahead and select these particular tracks. And I'm going to just say, we'll select these. I'll hold down the right modifier key. And let's say I have these particular sends turned on. So I'm gonna come over here and with quick link turned on, I'm just gonna route these to my reverb. So now I could turn on the reverb by hitting the button. So I'll come here. We could turn on the reverb, turn it on and off for each channel. Let's adjust the level and then I hit the other button to switch between pre and post fader. So right now I could do, uh, there's my eighth channel. So when I want to control nine through 16, I hit the next bank button and now fader one is now just, we've just moved the faders directly there. So if I want to control channels one through eight, I hit the previous bank button and we're controlling those channels. And I could just page through my various banks right here, hitting this one particular button. So that way I could load this particular uh, map, load this particular MIDI remote setting, and then have that says send one to faders. And then as soon as that's open, any track that's selected in the bank, I could just come over there and use the faders to control the send levels. So pretty cool thing that you could do. All right, um, so see question. Uh, the comping tool, the comping tool is great when 
All the performances are identical. We just want to pick the best take at any moment in time. Sometimes the takes are different. For example, uh, I've improvised a guitar solo. We want to grab the best riffs and combine them, often moving them in time. Have you ever gotten, have you gotten any workflow tips for this situation, especially selecting and moving sections, keeping various snips on the beat, crossfading when necessary, et cetera? All right, so let's go ahead and jump back to our comping project. Okay, so one of the cool things you could do is let's say, you know, when we do comping, using our comp tool, we can say, okay, we want to take this and this and like these different parts. Um, one of the things I always will suggest when doing comping is to, you know, make sure that you have the auto crossfade on. And that will make sure that it does quick fade ins and fade outs between different segments. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, if we have different takes and different parts that were in time, um, if we hold down Alt and Control or Command plus uh, option, you could just slip the audio itself within. So even if this was recorded at a completely different time, you could just slip the contents from different takes and just continue to just kind of select different portions of the comp. So even if it wasn't lined up in time, you're like, oh, they played that perfect thing like, you know, four beats later just simply come right over here and you could slip the audio within the events so that you can select whatever part of the take that you want for that moment in time. Okay, so I think we answered the next question. All right, so this came in from Benny. Um, so I, I was kind of working on this right before. I don't have it perfectly refined, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, Hi, Greg. Is it possible to make a macro that adds two seconds before and two seconds after when I mark the longest track with the key P uh, down mixing? So there's always a little space before and a little after. Hope you understand what I mean. Cubase 12 Pro. Okay. So let's just jump back. revert this all right so let's say if we have a, a section we're starting at the beginning and at the end i think what benny wants to do is to add two seconds of silence at the beginning and add two seconds of or time at the end to um to create just just to have a little bit of buffer a little bit of meat on the bones as they say sometimes all right, so I went to kind of a project logical editor, um, and that's not it. So let me just. All right, and I just went, doesn't like that preset. Let me just open this up again. Sorry about that. All right. Let's see if this project logical editor likes my preset again. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so I just set it up where um, I did a precondition of selecting all of the events. And sometimes, you know, there may be other elements that may not be selected. So just as a safety measure, um, I chose to select like audio, MIDI, chord, um, and it could be tempo. We could say, you know, arranger track. So, you know, different types of data here. Um, and then, so once we've selected all of the different events, then we're going to go to position and add two seconds. So under action target, and then for post process, I want to move the transport, uh, 
to the right locator, nudge the cursor to the right, and then set the right locator. So if we do this, um, we could come over here. So if you wanted this completely automated, we can now come over and run this macro. And let me just, I'm gonna select everything around the events here to set my left and right locators to start with. And I'm gonna to go to the beginning of the selection. So, and let me see if we could open that up again without it wigging out. So now when we hit apply, it's gonna add two seconds to all the events and automation and a ranger tracks tempo and hit apply. And then it's going to, now the one thing when we do this, it's gonna be at the end and it, I haven't gotten this to move the transport to the end of the event yet, but if we just take that over, but I'm, that should get you about 90% of the way there. Um, so, but I'll see if I can have it more refined, but that will add to the silence at the beginning, move all the events over in sync. And I'm still kind of working on getting it finalized at the end. So hopefully I may have to have it trigger another macro, but I should hopefully have that sorted out. And I could email you a screenshot over the weekend. All right, we have a question. Uh, when should reverence definitely be used instead of revelation? Uh, can Greg discuss which presets and reverence Greg thinks are very useful and for which situations? You know, conceptually, reverence is gonna be a convolution-based reverb. And you, the usual intention you know, and a convolution based reverb is basing the algorithms off of an impulse. Like it's sampled the ambient characteristics of a particular room, a church, a great studio, and it's captured that into a standard wave file. And you can load up standard wave impulses directly into reverence if you want. Uh, so it's captured those, and that is the basis for the reverb. So it's kind of based on real world conditions. So people often nav gravitate towards convolution reverbs for like orchestral scoring because they want it to sound like it's in a great concert hall. And one that, you know, so it's trying to emulate the sound of a real hall. Now, sometimes you may be trying to emulate a sound that doesn't naturally exist. You know, we could think of in the 80s, the classic, you know, kind of gated snare, you know, gated reverb, where you have such a, an immense reverb time that's immediately cut off that would never be possible in a, in a physical environment. It's just kind of like, okay, if it's going to have that big a sound, it's not going to be that big of a room. So when... So when you want to create, you know, maybe reverbs that aren't going to be, you know, limited in concept to a particular, um, you know, to a particular real world scenario, that's when revelation comes in handy. Now, revelation also has some really good stuff because you actually have kind of a high cut and low cut filters directly inside of revelation. So a lot of times people will do a lot of EQing of their reverb sends, but you don't necessarily have to do that in revelation. Some unique things that I like reverence for that may not be as obvious is, one is you could take just a particular, um, you know, one is you can say, okay, you could audition your different impulses, uh, but there's also the ability to do a reverse reverb. So if you want to do like a, you know, uh, there's lots of songs in the 80s would have this where all of a sudden you have like this snare goes, you know, and it has that kind of sound. And that was just a reversed reverb, you know, where they reprinted it with reverb and reversed that particular track. You know, think of the third verse of Scorpions, Rocky Like a Hurricane was a great example. Um, so you could take that reverse reverb and that could come up with some really interesting stuff. 
Something else that a lot of people don't know is there's great plates inside, you know, because it's not limited to just a reverb of a particular room, but if you wanted to actually have like, you know, plate reverbs where you could actually get a sense of what the, you know, of, you know, and plate reverbs, you know, probably aren't the most realistic reverbs, but we all grew up listening to so many records with plate reverbs that we have kind of an affinity toward it. So check out some of the different plate reverbs inside of Reverence as well. All right, so I'm going to go back to our live questions. Thanks for all the great questions. And again, if you learn something new, make sure you hit the like button. All right, let me just jump back. All right. All right, so I'm looking for David M's question. I see he wrote that he asked it again. Um, so maybe, I don't see it. I saw your comment that you asked it again. Um, yeah, maybe the question is too long, David. Um, but all right, so sorry about that. Maybe if you break it up, I think there's like a 200 character limit or something. Oh, you see, Jazz Dude hasn't doesn't see it as well. All right, John Costigan is sending a gentle reminder for everyone to hit the like button. See, Michael Pierce says he loves the slip and the comping technique. All right, just read through, see if we get David's question in. All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions. We'll see if there's any more that kind of sneak in. Maybe David could ask his question and break it up. Sorry, it's not going through. Or if you want to email it to me, David, I could show it on Tuesday's live stream if it's, uh, you know, if it's too long or if it's not coming through. All right, I'll give it another 30 seconds or so, and we'll see. There's more questions to come in. I want everyone to have a wonderful weekend. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Too many of my friends have gotten COVID recently. So don't want anyone here to get COVID. For the first time or again. Okay, so we see um, from Tabitha Rasa project, uh, when two MIDI regions touch each other, there are lines across them sometimes and the notes on the piano roll disappear. What's that? Okay, so let's go ahead. So generally when you see those kind of uh, diagonal lines that's indicating that there are uh, like, you know, two events, two different MIDI events that are overlapping each other. So let's say we'll make this big and obvious here. All right, so if I make a copy of this and these two events are, you know, we see this, that's where this event is going until here and this event is going on top. So um, if you want it, 
So when we double click, we may notice that we see these events and we double click on this event, we see the events, but we could have two different events playing, but maybe not visible. So let's say if I wanna take these events here and I'll just move them down and pitch. So now when I double click here, I don't see those particular events. So if we wanted to merge those, just grab the glue gun and then you could glue and all of the events will be together. So that's when we see those diagonal lines, again, that's indicating that the two events are just overlapping each other. Um, so we see how many VSTs can we put on a track? Is there a limit? So um, if it's VST effects, you could have 16 insert effects. You have six channel strip effects. Um, so we can come over here to the channel strip. So we have six, 16 inserts here. We have um, six channel strip. Uh, the EQ itself can have a pre-section with additional gain and phase and eight sends. So... We could say 16 plus 622, 30. Um, so, so you could have a lot. And if you need it more, you could then send it to a group and add another 30, send that to a group, add another 30, and it's all delay compensated for you. All right, see if there's any more questions that sneak in. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. I hope everyone learned a tip or trick. And if you did, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and that you hit the like button and tell your friends about it. And again, we should have our last live stream of the year on December 20th. So we'll do a Zoom and have kind of a holiday themed Zoomed party, a Zoom party. Uh, look forward to seeing new people with that. We'll see if there's any other questions. If not, we'll wrap up. Okay, so with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Thanks for all the questions. And David M., if you want to just email me your question that wasn't showing up under, uh, if you want to send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de, we'll make sure that we get it on Tuesday's live stream. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.